So, good evening and happy new year to the honorable speaker of the day, Mr. Amit Rai, honorable president of our association, honorable vice president, and all the participants of the day. Today is the birthday of an eminent industrialist known worldwide, a founder of modern leather industry of India, ex-president for more than three decades of our association, the legend, the Sanjay Shen. We celebrate every year this date in memory of his immense contribution for Indian leather industry and our association. I request Mr. Anup Kumar Jha, the Honorable President of our association, to start the event with his welcome address. Mr. Jha, please. Good evening, Mr. Amit Rai, Managing Director, ORG India Private Limited. Mr. Sushantu Mullik, General Secretary, Indian Leather Technologies Association. Mr. A. B. Kanungo, Vice President, ILTA. Members, colleagues, recipient of Sanjay Sen Memorial Awards, Dr. Prabhul Kumar Basu, scholarship winners, students, friends from industry, ladies and gentlemen. I, on behalf of the Executive Committee of ILTA, heartily welcome you all to join and participate in the 20th Sanjay Sen Memorial Lecture on the birthday of this great legendary personality. To be delivered by Mr. Amit Ray, Managing Director, ORG India Private Limited, titled Impact of Pandemic in India Across Economy Sectors. On this day, the toppers of the Majapur Institute of Technology in BTEC Leather Technology exam, and that from Hartcourt Butler Technological Institute, Kanpur, are awarded with Sanjay Shen Memorial Award. The topper in BTEC Leather Technology exam and composite topper in 2020 will be awarded Sanjay Shen Memorial Gold Medal. The names of Dr. Prafulla Basu Scholarship winners is declared on this auspicious day too. Mr. Sanjay Shen was the president of ILT for more than two decades. President of the Governing Body of Government College of Engineering and Blood Technology, Chairman of the Research Council of CSIR CLRI, the premier research institute in the world, introducer of ILTA to represent in India <coughs> as the member society in the International Union of Leather Technologists and Chemist Societies, and became also the president of it. He was the chairman of third consultation of leather and leather products industry in 1984 and as an expert and consultant for leather and leather products for Unido. Mr. Sen was technocrat by profession and entrepreneur by practice and was one of the most versatile industrialists in, this, in India during his period. He was the chairman of Russian Tenery Company Limited, director Mr. Sen Rally Limited, Chairman, Sen and Pandit Industries Limited, Director, Noah Khali Machine Tools Limited, and Director, Bengal Water Group, etc. Mr. Sen was President of Indian Engineering Association, later known as CII, Vice Chairman of Engineering Export Promotion, Chairman, Export Promotion Council for Finnish Leather and Leather Manufacturing. His multiples of responsibilities with me. Today, at this pandemic stage, Mr. Sen could be one of the most thought after personality in industry to consult. Prior to outburst of COVID-19, Indian economy was not at a very comfortable stage. But since mid of March and April 2020, we started moving into pandemic stage, being negatively affected socially and financially. The physically handicapped troubled persons generates troubled economy, 
and the condition is not yet stable. Quite a number of sectors are adversely affected and the stability is yet to be established and formulated. At this juncture, we are fortunate to have with us a highly knowledgeable personality like Mr. Amit Ray to deliver the 20th Sanjayshan Memorial Lecture on an <clears throat> absolute befitting subject and share his valuable knowledge with us. With this, it was my dedication. And once again, I thank you. I request Mr. Kushanta Malik to take over the question. Thank you, Mr. Jha. There are two segments of our today's program. And the first segment is in memory of Sanjay Shen. Every year we felicitate the students of different institutes who secured first class first position in leather technology examination in, from different institutes of India. So let me announce the names. This year we have awards for three institutes. First of all, Ms. Ragini Saraj, winner of Sanjayshan Memorial Award for securing first class first in BTEC laser technology examination from Mujafarpur Institute of Technology, Bihar in 2021. Congratulations, Ms. Ragini. We'll send your certificate and the award by courier to your residence. Second award is going to Mr. Ovai Khan Singh, winner of Sanjayshan Memorial Award for securing first class first in BTEC in laser technology examination from Hartcourt Butler Technical University, Kanpur, UP in 2021. Congratulations, Mr. Ovai. The same thing, we will send your certificate and the award by courier to your residence. Next is, there are some awards and scholarships. It is given by Government College of Engineering and Air Technology every year on this date of Sanjayshal Memorial event organized by ILTA. And these awards and scholarships are sponsored by Mr. Chandan Basu, an eminent industrialist in memory of Sanjayshan and his father, Dr. Prabhullo Kumar Basu. To announce the name, Ms. Pronita Chakravarti, winner of Sanjayshan Memorial Gold Medal for first class first in BTEC leather technology examination and composite topper in 2020. And the scholarships, Dr. Prahullo Kumar Basu scholarship, winners are Mr. Biswajit Jana, Ms. Juin Kundu, Ms. Ayugma Sengupto, And the fourth one is Mr. Tuhin Jana. Congratulations to all of you. The checks of the scholarships is lying with the principal government college of engineering and technology, Dr. Sanjay Chakravarti. Please collect it from Mr. Chakravarti. So now I would request uh, Mr. Avai Khan Singh to say a few words. He expressed his desire to say a few words. So I invite Mr. Singh to come on the microphone, please. Please Hello. unmute yourself. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, honorable Speaker, Mr. Amitre, uh, uh, President, Mr. Arnab Jha, uh, General Secretary, Sushanta Malik. <clears throat> I would like to thank everyone for this award. 
I am very much pleased and humbled to receive the award uh, for the Sanjay Sen Memorial Gold Medal this year. And uh, I never thought to one single day that I will be honored with this prestigious award, uh, but without my supporting uh, pillars of life, uh, who always cheered me and guided me without any obligations, this would not have been possible. <clears throat> I would like to thank uh, our Honorable HOD, uh, Mr. Sub Suman Chatterjee, Harcourt Patar Technical University, for interesting me for this honor. I want to thank my teachers, uh, especially Mr. Abhishek Lan, uh, who believed in me and guided me with all sorts of uh, problems, whether personal or professional. He always ensured that I give my best to, to uh, <clears throat> in class and my life. Lastly, I am indebted to my uh, most significant supports, to my parents and my friends for always being there for me through all ups and downs. With all your support, I achieved my dreams without any obstacle. This award will surely be an essential part of my life and it will always motivate me for the rest of my future. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Over to thank you, you Mr. Thank you, Mr. Avoy. Thanks for your nice words. Thank you. So, congratulations, and we we wish all the best in your future life. Thank you. Sir. So, let us go for the second part of the event. So, I request our honorable president, Mr. Anup Jha, to introduce our honorable speaker of the day to the participants. There could be some questions uh, in the mind of the participants. You may please send the questions through chat, which could be addressed by the speaker during his speech. Else, you can raise your hand and at the end of the memorial lecture, you will be asked to ask your question so that you can get your reply and satisfy yourself. So I request our Honorable President, Mr. Jha, to introduce our Honorable Speaker. I have been given the responsibility to introduce Mr. Amit Ray, whose activities are so big, so wide, that it will take one session to really read out them. So myself and my vice president, we jointly tried to make a short of it, a gist of it. I, I take a apology just if anything is missing. Uh, and I'm introducing Mr. Roy with his activities. Mr. Roy is a mechanical engineer from Bengal Engineering College, Sipur. MBA operations, finance and major from Indian Institute of Management, Kolkata and LLB from Calcutta University. He has many publications in his name, like Statistical Model of Forecasting Growth of Retail Outlets in India, Supermarket Growth in India, The David and Goliath Story, Developing a New ACC for Conducting Consumer Research in Rural India, etc. He is connected with different professional associations such as European Society of Market Research, Market Research Society of UK, Market Research Society of India, and is a live member of Institute of Public Health Engineers India. He is involved with different new research startups and different forms of audit like semi-durable, durable retails, doctor's prescription audit, etc. in India and abroad too. He has been involved with designing, construction, and commissioning of mini cement plants, and also sponge from best mini steel plants. In his professional capacity, the positions he holds are member project selection committee, KUSP Innovative Challenge Fund, past member of brand protection committee of CII, honorable vice chairman, IIM Calcutta Alumni Association, visiting faculty at IIM Calcutta, visiting at ISBM Calcutta, 
teaching faculty at Eastern Institute of Management, Calcutta, and a member of Final Selection Committee for IIM Calcutta Intents. He has been involved with ORG in different positions in India and abroad since long, and presently is the Managing Director of ORG India Private Limited. Today's lecture by Mr. Ramadra is titled Impact of the Pandemic in India Across the Economy Sectors. I think we will enjoy and learn from this lecture. I request Mr. Roy to proceed for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, General Secretary, and other office bearers of IRTA all respected guests and attendees for this program. Uh, to start with, I will briefly tell you this much that the slides that I have created, these are not creative slides. These are very plain Jane slides. Uh, the topic is so wide that it would have taken more than an hour to even do small justice to it. So I had to compress things. So some of the slides may look a little cluttered. You don't bother. I will read them out, whatever is the substance in the slides. And I will circulate these slides through the ILTA to all those who are interested later on to have a look at it if they need any, any reference or anything of that sort. So with that, I will uh, start the actual presentation. If you have any questions, you can post them on the chat. Or if you want to hold and ask your questions later, you can do your raise your hand after I finish my presentation. And then I'll try and address as many questions as possible within the limitations of time. So here we go. Okay, so <clears throat> the title of the talk is Impact of the Pandemic in India Across Economy Sectors. So I started by saying that there are many sectors which is not possible to touch all of them in one go. I have tried to cover the major areas. Okay, just for everybody's reminder, we always talk of the lockdown, but some people, all of us may be not remembering the day it started and the day it sort of got withdrawn. It was March 24th when it was announced, the first 21-day lockdown. Then it was extended to May 3rd. Then again, uh, it was extended to May 17th. And then extended again till May 31st and then June 7th. So overall lockdown was from 24th of March to June 7th. June 8th, limited unlock started. That's why you call it unlock one. July 1, it was a little more relaxation. So it became unlock number two. Progressively beyond that, we've had small and uh, large unlocks in various states, in districts, in towns, etc. So I'm not getting into those details because those are more of recent memory to all of you. And we all know that uh, the second wave hit us from February 22, sorry, uh, on February 22, and it continued till June 7, 2021. After June 7, we thought we had come out of everything, and we now know now we have the third wave going. Okay. So overall, if you summarize uh, the situation that happened, there was across the board disruption in the economy. The contraction of the economy happened. There is no growth. It's a negative thing. The contraction, first of all, we had a 6.1% growth in GDP in FY19, which came down to 4.1%, which is about two third reduction. Uh, and then uh, the current financial year, which we are about to close, it is projected because the figures are not yet out. It is projected that the GDP will become a negative growth of 5%. So you already have a reduction in 2019, or 2020 over 2019, and then 2021, again over 2019. Though the final figures are, are uh, that expected that in 2021 financial year, we are likely to grow by 9.3%. But if you look at the fact that it is a going to be a growth over a negative 5%, then the real growth may be only about 4%. But that's about statistics and figures. Uh, a, the, there is a publication from Nomura India. Nomura is a very uh, well-known international financial intermediary and, uh, and research house that the economic activity 
between the 22nd of March, which is just before the lockdown, to the 26th of April, which is uh, in 2020, which is just after the lockdown started, the, there was a huge drop from an index of 82.9 to 44.7, almost a 45% drop. That we know can happen because every economic activity came to a standstill. Then unemployment. And we all have heard of the huge problem of uh, migrant labor that happened after post the first lockdown. Then uh, at that point in time, from a 6.7% unemployment, which is not a very happy situation, by the way, but for a country like India, we've learned to live with a lot of things. So from 6.7% on 15th of March, which is just before uh, the lockdown, to just after the lockdown, they, it went up to 26%. That is obvious because a lot of industries, small businesses, virtually closed. And even shops and establishments could not open in the first period uh, very much. So they also had to actually let go a lot of employees. Many of their employees had to go back home uh, to their villages and other places. So the employment was lost. Then uh, if you look at uh, what is the total impact of the number of jobs lost, according to CMI, Center for Monitoring Indian Economics, you've been a very respected uh, house which produces research report on statistics on the economy. 140 million Indians, which means about 14 crores of Indians out of a total population of 130 crores, you can imagine. The total working population is about 70 crores at the most. Out of that, 14 crores lost their job, which means one fifth of people lost their job. So two in 10 persons actually lost their job due to the lockdown. And then more than 45% households across the nation reported an income drop from the point before the lockdown to the point after the lockdown. Then there were problems with the supply chains because any industry requires a, a supply chain from its uh, in to, to input supply chain as well as an output supply chain. Output is to deliver to customers, input is the raw materials and semi-assembled semi, uh, uh, products, et cetera, that go into the manufacturing of the products. Now, because of transportation being blocked, transport workers not being available, factories not running because of the workers not being able to attend to the factories from their distances at home and various other reasons, there was a huge problem in the, in the supply chain, which led to a constraint in production, which we have seen as the result of that is the contraction in the economy. Then uh, more affected than others were the people in the informal sector and daily wages. You see, construction is a huge informal sector and all construction activities stop. There is a large number of temporary workers which are used in various industries like the jute industry and various agro-based industries. All that suddenly vanished overnight. And these people do not have a fallback option of a regular wage like government employees do, even if they don't go to work, they don't have that. So if you can't attend to work, you're a daily paid worker, you lose your earnings. And these are the people who suffered the most. And these are the people who created all those images across the front lines, front pages of newspapers, who are trudging back home with a thing on their back, no, no communication, no transport, and so on. And uh, though the agricultural sector was not affected because it was not part of the lockdown in any way, but if you look at the people who had uh, uh, products which are perishables, fruits, vegetables, etc., they could not transport their product to the market because of transportation under lockdown. So these people suffered a lot. And the net result was that if you have all, all of us know that the rise in the cost of these products later on in the market is because those people who had these huge losses had to make up for that in terms of increasing the prices and also the cost of transportation has gone up. Then if you see the, uh, uh, the as I said, for, for agricultural production, the crops, the field crops were not affected much, but all kinds of perishable products which are agricultural or dairy related had a major impact. The other big area is the tea estates. The first flush which happens in the, in the months of March, April and May, which is the highest value of tea that gardens uh, enjoy in the market in terms of quality, 
that was badly affected because of the lockdown, the first lockdown. And uh, tea is something, if you don't pluck the leaves uh, at the right time, if they grow into bigger size, then they are of no use. So after one month, it has no value. Then uh, the entire Darjeeling tea industry, which is also primarily export driven because it's a high value tea, uh, that got very badly affected. And total in India, tea exports, which is a major income earner for the country and boosts the GDP, one third, 33% was the loss compared in terms of export from 2019 to 2020. Then uh, tea sector, in terms of actual value of production, has lost 140 million kgs. This is uh, made tea production. It is not the green leaf production. Normally, it's one is to five. So in terms of green leaf, it is about 700 million kgs of green leaf, which we have lost. Yeah. Now we'll come to individual sectors. I picked up a few sectors for uh, this thing, we just covered the food and agriculture. Now I'm looking at the aviation sector. And the aviation and tourism, these are also major uh, uh, legs of the economy. A, because uh, aviation and tourism both bring in substantial amounts of foreign exchange. And also they are very important uh, for the rural economy because most of the tourism areas are in rural areas. So for secondary income growth in the rural economy, tourism is an important thing. Uh, you see that uh, the total contribution of aviation and tourism to the GDP, aviation is about 2.4% and GDP is about 9.2%. Now they were the first to be hit, obviously, because of the constraints on movement by the lockdown. Now, uh, uh, even the, this time, the hit is even larger than the crisis of 2008, when you know when the American banks folded and there was a global hit on, on the economies of all countries. Well, it, is, it is bigger than that. The primary reason is the cash flow issue, because you had to pay your pilots, you had to pay your leasing fees for your aircraft, which were not flying, you had to pay your employees, and also you had to return the tickets that were ca cancelled by people. Now, uh, as many of you already know that most airlines couldn't refund the tickets and they had held on to that and they had asked for uh, time to pay back. So uh, a lot of people have still not got their refund <laughs> back after even more than one year. Uh, but this was, this was the primary reason where there was no income, but a committed expenditure. And uh, finally, Though they, in the initial period they held on to their employee, but gradually they had to, uh, you know, ultimately let them go. And 38 million layoffs. Can you imagine? There are people like porters, loaders, traffic assistants, people who put the wheel chocks on the aircraft, people who put the ladders on the aircraft, people who clean the toilets at the airport, and people who push the trolleys. All these kind of people are the first to get laid off. Over 38 million layoffs in the aviation and tourism. In tourism, all the people, the cooks, the darwans, the uh, the cleaning staff of the small hotels and establishment and uh, and homestays, all of them got sacked. Then uh, and and, and uh, if you look at the aviation sector and the uh, and the tourism sector, the hospitality industry had also white collar jobs like managers and other things of hotels. They got sacked. In the tourism sector, there are tour operators and there are uh, people who guide who act as tour guides. They also got sacked. Excuse Excuse me. Me. Hello, Mr. Da, your slides are not moving on not, the screen. Where is it stuck? It, it, which, which slide is it stuck on? Let me ask the me. first slide is on, on, on the screen now. First one. And the this first one. one. Now, now you have to move the, to the next one. Uh, is it, is it moving now? No, no. No. I'll do one thing. I'll stop sharing and share again. Then it will probably get... Yeah, better. Uh, just one second. So I was on to this one, food and agriculture I just covered. I was talking about the aviation and tourism sector. And uh, the last point on this was that, the, just as an example, the transport companies like the Ola and Ubers of this world, only Ola cabs so lost 95% of business in from March to April. You can understand in April, when the lockdown happened in March, all these cabs were stopped from flying on the street. So obviously 95% went down. 5% that was running was because of essential services. They had to put essential service stickers on their cabs and they could run. 
so that is the only thing which operated uh, <clears throat> the loss to aviation and tourism was over rupees 15000 crores between march and april 2020 march 2019 and april 2020 there is a huge industry called live events industry i mean you all can understand these are where public performances are held uh, whether it is for musical programs or open air theaters or as we know in bengal there is this jatra festivals and all that and that industry also was not possible to continue so and they they lost about 3000 crores and all the performers support staff etc all those people also lost their jobs the iato which is the indian association of tour operators estimates that the losses only to the tourism sector is 8500 crores now if you see the figure 15000 crores that includes aviation and tourism and this is only the tourism 8500 crores but there was a little positive side of the pandemic though it, it does not affect the economy but it has it has been the application of technology now those who have been flying after the pandemic are aware that there are new techni technologies which have come in where you know contactless uh, you know uh, boarding passes and then various other scanning technologies for uh, you know your bag etc now you can see that the bags have come into trays and there is an automatic diversion for any bag which is suspect the other bags just go through nobody has to touch it so some of the technology applications has just come in and there are technology applications which is coming to our lives on the other areas also just like we now use zoom uh, or other kinds of uh, vc software uh, to meet and talk which was only done physically earlier so technology has moved in and replaced a lot of activities which were done physically Well, let's talk about the telecom sector. It, this again is a very important part of our economy. Six point five percent of the GDP and employs almost four million people. Forty you know, lakhs are employed here. And uh, if you see the numbers, there was one point one eight billion connections as of December two thousand twenty, which means, uh, and there was a huge growth in those connections because people could not move out. they had to rely on telephones or mobile phones to keep connected to each other so there was a huge increase but that did not sustain later on let me come to that there was a huge increase in the broadband usage more than the voice usage because industries companies trade all relied just like we are doing using emails or zoom or other kinds of meetings online meetings to continue their business because physical presence was not possible that put a lot of pressure on the network and demand increased by about 10% resultant obviously we all know even today that the quality of the calls and the quality of the connection has gone down but what has happened is post december 2020 there is a huge drop in new subscribers It, there is a lot of cannibalization which is happening amongst the top three companies. We know Vodafone is not in the pink of health, and you know Reliance is very aggressive and all that. So cannibalization is happening. But at the same time, only one month from December to January saw fourteen point two lakhs net drop of connections. That connection loss is coming from the lowest strata. for whom physical connection was replaced by this telephone connection and as soon as the markets opened up those people went back to their physical places of work like the 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 workers who are mobile and big uh, the migrant workers so many of them now then dropped the cell phone connection because it was no longer required by them. and this drop is now continuing not for this reason alone because such a large number of people have lost their regular income at the same time the cost of telephony has gone up the basic packages which are used by most of these people which are primarily the prepaid packages the minimum amount has gone up from 45 rupees to 70 rupees and it is going to go up to 100 rupees now because of that lot of these people had to give up their connection 
the government of course came to the rescue of the sector as we have all read in the newspapers by uh, restructuring the payments from these companies which had actually uh, been caught out on not paying the arc so uh, and also to save jobs but the 5g scenario which would have already happened in india by this time if the uh, if this lockdown had not happened and the economy had not been hit is now pushed back by at least a year so the benefits of 5g we will not be able to see in this financial year coming up maybe we'll have to wait till december 22 now the pharmaceutical sector this is one sector where which has gained positively from the lockdown uh, the biggest uh, improvement in this sector is that their growth from 3% has gone to 15% you can imagine five times is the growth market size of this sector is very large dollar 55 billion which was at the beginning of uh, 2020 and it has been growing like anything i mean because they have been exporting drugs like hydroxychloroquine which happened in the initial stages though though it is not so important now but they are uh, also licensed manufacturing a lot of the new drugs for covid and other other diseases personal protection equipment that has been a major area of exports and vaccines of course we know india is the largest vaccine producer in the world so we are making a lot of money in this sector Uh, but uh, the small negative is that the active pharmaceutical in in ingredient which are apis their primary supplier was china and india does not enjoy the best of relations with china anymore because of that the chinese have been pushing india by increasing their api prices and that has impacted the cost of manufacturing in india which has led to a for the common man increase in the prices of even common medicine that anybody who has gone to a pharmacy outlet to buy some Uh, medicine even uh, things like uh, you know crocin or anything would know that there is been a substantial increase in price the this industry in spite of being a, a, a growth driver has also been affected badly because of the uh, for some time there was a ban on export of some of the critical products which the government thought is more important to indian audience but then there were other issues of import containers getting stuck at the ports or at the airports because there were no people to clear them there was problem of transport to bring them to the factories and there are uh, their own employees they could not uh, all of them could not attend every shift because social distancing norms and government saying somewhere 50% somewhere 20% somewhere 30% only people and can work in a shift so that also affected them let's look at the sector oil and gas this is a major uh, area of the indian economy not because we import the oil we are uh, third largest energy consumer in in the world and we and this contributes to 5.2% of the global oil demand in the entire world oil demand we are 5.2% lockdown helped us in curbing the demand for oil because there was no transportation both personal and commercial industrial transportation all went down so demand for transport fuel went down and the automobile and industrial manufacturing sector also went down so goods and passenger movements well demand went down that was good for india because till date we import about 60% of our fuel and oil requirements and we don't have that much of manufacturing in india what happened is crude crude prices at the same time hugely dipped in this lockdown period which was a big relief for the government and they used this opportunity to raise the taxes on the fuel to keep the market prices same the difference was made up by additional sponging of money by the government to fund extraordinary covid related expenditure both the hospital and healthcare infrastructure as well as for the vaccines so without actually having to cough up funds the government used the left arm to fund the right arm through this process and uh, it also used this uh, time of low cost low prices of, of of petroleum products to fill strategic reserves you know the government of india has two or three locations of strategic reserves on land in india it has also got a strategic reserve in colombo and sri lanka and it used ships because again the shipping lanes had no traffic it used vacant uh, shipping storage uh, that is uh, oil contain oil oil uh, transporting ship uh, ships and filled them up with products and kept them afloat because there was 
no physical storage available anymore and they took the advantage of the low prices however at the current time the global prices have hit the roof again so the government is doing two things one you have seen that they uh, reduced the central excise a little bit by 10 rupees but they have not again this is a very interesting thing what they have done they have started releasing this strategic storage crude to the manufacturers without importing so to avoid the high import cost they have done this and therefore they could pass on some of the excise duty cuts to the individual users now let's come to leather products because this is one area which you have very much more knowledge than i do i will just talk of the top line uh, effects of the lockdown on the leather sector india as you know is the second largest exporter producer of footwear second largest exporter of leather garments and fifth largest exporter of leather goods in the world overall we have an annual production of approximately 3 billion square feet and india accounts for 13% of world's production of leather it is also for 9% of annual global footwear production now our total exports uh, approximately are between 5.5 to 6 billion annually in us dollars what happened is that international brands cancelled existing orders negotiated for lower prices and reduced the number in terms of the order this you are aware of this impacted the total offtake in terms of export demand and the, thereby affecting the entire chain which is primarily in india a very uh, manual manual labor oriented uh, manufacturing so the entire workforce was badly affected because of this decline in export demand and uh, the decline if quantified is about slightly more than 10% in in 2020 2021 as compared to 1920 you are aware of these of these uh, figures i would not go too much into this but this amounts to approximately 1.5 billion loss in us dollars in terms of exports and due to the global restrictions both last christmas and new year and this christmas and new year which are looked forward by the leather industry because the uh, the supply chain works 3 to 4 months ahead of the events to fill up the shop shelves uh, in the walmarts and and other large supermarket chains across the world now their ordering was less because for them in the last christmas and new year also there were restrictions on movement as like this year and therefore there was a huge slump in this uh, festival demand that the leather industry depends on every year we all know that 90% of footwear i mean this is one of the other important factors in india that the 90% of the footwear part is actually consumed in india this is a big fallback thing just like tea if you have a healthy domestic market then you can absorb a lot of shocks in the export market however this also got badly hit why because when you have work from home people do not go out there is no need to have formal wear which is leather is primarily used for formal outdoor wear you are you have a drop in family income there is a job insecurity even if you have the job you don't know how long you will go to continue to have it and there is also a temporary close down of the retail stores from where you buy so overall this also impacted the leather uh, the footwear consumption in uh, as far as domestic demand is concerned the government did help by hiking the import import duty on uh, footwear from 25% to 35% to encourage domestic demand being converted from domestic manufacture uh, that will see some more time to i mean see the real effects on the industry the other negative thing that happened just recently is that the gst rate has been changed to 12% from 5% for sh- uh, shoes whose or footwear whose uh, retail price is 1000 rupees now there is a large volume which is under that pricing which goes into the market and that will certainly get affected by this change then let's look at the stock markets stock markets are abuzz they are you know holding the headlines of newspapers for quite some time on but the interesting thing is see 24th march is when the uh, announcement came and on 23rd march one day before that there was a huge drop in the stock market 
Now, this can only happen if somebody had insider knowledge. Otherwise, this could not happen. And you know, in India, these are the kind of things that you've seen all the time. However, just after the 24th March lockdown announcement, just one day later, the Sensex bounced back. Why? Because people made their money by artificially depressing the market one day ahead of it. And then once the people, when certainty came that this is a lockdown and this is only going to last for three weeks, that's the original thing. Then people got back confidence in the market and then the shares went up to their normal levels. Then in the month of April, which is less than 21 days from uh, the announcement of the lockdown, the Americans mentioned that, you know, the peak has been reached of the uh, pandemic and then everything will be very nice and hunky-dory in the future. So given that understanding and we are always reliant on the Western world for giving us advice on this kind of areas of pandemics because we don't have any, uh, did not have any, any anything on that kind of knowledge inside our country at that time. So the uh, stock market went up from the original uh, level and uh, went to 9,500 where everybody said, no, the economy has revived already. Just imagine, uh, it is just about a month after announcement of the lockdown and the lockdown had already been extended. So uh, why did this happen? And why is it happening now? It is my theory. I could be proved wrong, but see, there is uh, the work from home and closed schools and no holidays. Now, what happens because of this is all the expenditure that you had, first on local conveyance, two on people on school children, their, uh, their expenses were going and coming to school, their tiffin and other things. No expenses on the family holidays mm -hmm. and no out of home entertainment. Because you cinema halls, theaters, restaurants, everything are closed. So you have households have more cash. I'm talking about those households who still had uh, steady jobs. And these are the people who invest in the stock markets, not the uh, migrant labor. So they have surplus cash. And simultaneously, the bank interest had gone down to something like 5%. So people were looking for opportunities to make money, which is higher than the bank interest. And the stock market climbing was because of that feeding that market with this cash. So higher and higher expectations pushed up the market. And if you read the stories today, that most of the investment that has happened in the stock market to push it to the 60,000 mark is by totally new investors. And most of them are youngsters. So this is the reason why the stock market has climbed. It has no reflection on the real state of the economy. Now let's look at another sector called e-commerce. You see, in the uh, third week of March, when the government uh, and, uh, you know, law announced the lockdown, there, they also said that there will be no home delivery, no e-commerce. And then there was a hue and cry, and then, we, then they said, OK, only essential items will be allowed to be done through home delivery. Basically, grocery item, pharmaceutical item, packaged food items. So all the major e-commerce players, Amazon, Walmart, Flipkart, Big Basket, Grofers, Grofers is now called Blinkit, all had restricted services. But people went for it because they could not access the physical markets. So therefore, even with the restricted range of products that could be home delivered, these platforms grew like mad. And on top of that, if you look at it, that the third wave has again created constraints for people to move. And the uh, psych psychosis of fear is so much now ingrained in people are getting ingrained that we are not going to move away from these online purchases very soon. And uh, just for figures, the market is going to reach 111 billion by 2024 and 200 billion by 2026. So these are e-commerce market. This all comes from the physical market. 
four percent was the total food and grocery apparel and consumer electronics retail trade all together till march 2020 and it is expected to grow to eight percent this is the share it is taking away from conventional retail and you can see it is a, going to be a hundred percent increase in five years hundred percent increase on a growing base because the total base on which it one four percent or eight percent is being calculated, that base is also going to grow. Therefore, this e-commerce industry is become very important not only because of the volume it sells, but because of the gig economy it supports. I'll come to that later. Now let's look at a very strange thing called al alcoholic beverages market. You know, a lot of people know that when you're sitting at home, what to do in the evenings? All you can do is do glug glug. Okay. <laughs> now, Delhi and Andhra Pradesh, first of all, all liquor shops were closed. Then when they started opening, some of them also allowed e-commerce, but they increased the taxes on liquor. It started with Delhi and Andhra by 70 to 75%. And they called it Corona tax. Shortly, states like Maharashtra, West Bengal, many others followed. People had no option. So there was a, this additional income came to the state governments. Also because, you know, liquor is the third largest source of income for a large number of states where there is not much of industrial activity. But even if this happened, at the bottom end of the market, there were no people who could buy e-commerce uh, liquor. And because of the... Uh, prices being increased by 70 to 75%, that sector, which we, which we call country liquor, got badly affected and people moved to illicit consumption, which affected their health, raised number of people who are dying. But this part got totally knocked out, badly knocked out, I'd say. Urban consumption was still somewhat there, but rural areas, the consumption went away. And therefore, black marketing and illicit liquor became very common. Of course, now the governments have started rolling back those corona taxes because they have now found that with these high taxes and prices, consumption has gone down and ultimately affected their final net income on excise duty on liquor. So now let's come to the gig economy, which is talking about who, who what constitutes the gig economy. And this term is now widely used by the press and media also. It's basically online platform workers, which is why I said e-commerce people who are involved in packing, storing, delivering. So all those are actually temporary workers. Then there are contract workers who work on, say, your construction projects and various other similar kind of this jute industry. All these are actually gig economy. They are coming and going. On-call workers who are driving ambulances or driving, you know, this Ola and Uber cabs and so on. Their jobs are not fixed. Neither is their remuneration fixed. They are the people who are currently, there are 15 million freelance or gig workers across India now. And they are likely to service 90 million jobs. We mean that they are going to replace 90 million jobs in the next 10 years. 10 years, not tomorrow. So uh, th it is this gig economy which has somewhat come as a relief because they have engaged a lot many unemployed people whether they have been unemployed by losing their jobs or whether they are unemployed youth who, are, who had no jobs, they have engaged them. As a result, you have seen two-wheeler sales have gone up tremendously in that period because these people bought two-wheelers to you know, run errands, do deliveries, and so on and so forth. But the sad part is that while a large number of jobs have been created, don't forget that these people did not have jobs, mostly. So it was not that their families were reliant or, or dependent on them. It is in, welcome to get a new earning member in the family. But what about families who lost traditional jobs? Where families were dependent on the income of that individual, those jobs have gone. Now let's look at the change in consumer behavior. We've been talking about what happens to the various sectors of the industry. Basic priorities of consumers have changed. People are focusing first on the basic needs, which is hygiene, cleaning, staples, which is your rice, atta, sugar, etc., etc. 
non essential categories were postponed in terms of consumption because of the as i said the fear psychosis then the other thing that has happened is because of this fear psychosis and of course constraints physical constraints consumers have moving in hordes onto the digital commerce platforms and the third part is hoarding whenever we face a situation and or we or we uh, interpret a situation to be adverse we tend to hoard this is a common human psychology and uh, this has also resulted in temporary stockouts and shortages and price increases in the market then the way people change you know you spend their leisure time is changing drastically since you can't go out then all external engagement is not uh, going to be there for quite some time to come these habits are permanently likely to change like for example more than half that is 61% people are planning to continue watching more news because people are anxious so they watch more news 55% will prioritize more time with family now that they are they have spent more time with family more interaction with family uh, needs those who used to 9 o'clock go to office and come back at 6 o'clock and say i can't do anything about anything else because i am so tired i've been working the whole day now they are in the house so they have to understand they have understood a more, much more about the operations of the home and therefore have decided that they will prioritize more time with the family entertainment learning learning obviously learning education is separate from learning learning is on various other aspects there are a number of people who are watching youtube videos of doing various things the diy the uh, the, the cooking and so on and so forth education because of the uh, thing uh, the, uh, the pandemic has obviously moved a major part of it to online and again because the wave upon wave is postponing the opening of schools and colleges it is going to sustain for some more time and what i anticipate is some part of it will permanently remain in the public domain as online for example your your distance education which was physical distance education in terms of sending materials and other thing is totally online embracing digital technology now you see that people how they react to certain constraints and changes in their environment we we when we don't like something we don't do it but now out of necessity there are old grandmas who are opening up their apps on their phones and ordering groceries from their phone today there are people like us who never had thought about having to use these kind of video services for meetings other than e-commerce people have learned to use e-wallets because going to the bank getting the cash all that has become a problem so and people do not have change in the market so e-wallets are being used to buy various things lot of elderly people who now cannot go to the bank because 